I'm telling you, I'm just starting going into the study of <laughs> the whole pre-planned event of Christ laying down His life, and I'm just, I am, I have not studied this in depth, as I've said before, the gospel before a gospel, and it's really hitting home for me. Uh, I've been trying to memorize scripture and then meditate on it. I don't know if you've done that. If you've done it in the past, keep doing it. Keep doing it. I'm still on Ephesians 1, and I can't get past the second verse without stopping in. Praise be the God, our Father, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For He chose us. He chose me in Him before the foundation of the world. To be holy and blameless in his sight. I can't go on. I have to stop there because to think about this, God in his mind, in his will, and in his pleasure. He did all this because it pleased him. I still can't get over that. That before the foundation of the world, he chose us. He called us out. And he made us holy and blameless. From, from our perspective, we look at that and like, I've got to be holy and blameless because I'm a believer in Christ. But what that's saying is, you are holy and blameless. God looks at us and sees Christ. And I look at myself, I think, I am a selfish man. I am a prideful man. I am disobedient. I'm talking me as a Christian. I mean, I was worse before I knew Christ. I'm still a sinner. A dirty, rotten sinner. And yet God says, you are holy and blameless. That's the gospel. It's all because Christ, because I am in Christ. All the heavenly blessings. This morning I just, that's just one. And so we're going to study here about this God that stepped out of heaven and had everything just prepared before him, right? Right? He knew Jesus walked every day knowing his life was going to end on the cross, dying for me and you. So I bring this up because I, I'm, I, I'm really concerned about each one of you, that you're taking the time to get in the Word, and if you don't feel drawing that you're drawing closer to God, find a pastor. Find, I'm saying, don't don't just come to church on Sunday. Find pastors that are teaching the Word during the week, not motivational speakers. People that are teaching the Word, and when you're done, you're like, wow, wow, I'm I'm. I can see God. I can praise Him. I can worship. I want to worship Him. 
That, that's having the word enter in and draw you near to God. Because that is the most important thing, that you're drawing close to Him, walking with Him, not just knowing about Him. Knowing about Him is important because that's the step you need to know Him. To know Him. I feel sometimes like I don't know Him at all, but other times it's like, I know you so well, I, I want to be in your presence. Wow. The enamoring of the world has wore off in my life. I don't know if you're to that point yet. There, there's just a few things that tickle my ears here and there. But I'm saying, God, I want you center. I want you to be in the midst of all things. And there's areas where I, I hold him back and I'm trying to say, come on in. Start to work in these areas. And one verse that really has stuck out that's going to go right along with where we're at is Jesus saying, I have not come to be served. I have come to serve. And I give my life as a ransom for many. That's Mark 10.46, 10.45. Our Creator came to this world not to be served, but to serve. And so, me as a Christian, as His follower, I am not to be served, I am to serve. And I've got to find a way to do that. Each one of us have to find a way. And with your spiritual gifts, whatever. Um, because you find that you're drawn to Christ when you do that, right? When you serve the Lord, it's like, oh, that, that felt right. That, that's what I'm supposed to do. Cry out to the Lord. Lead me where I'm supposed to be, Father. I just want to draw close to you. I want to serve you. And, and this, Jesus gave this response because the disciples were struggling, or not struggling, they're arguing over who's the, going to be greatest in the kingdom. <laughs> right? Their pride. Who's, who's going to be better? It's that whole religious comparative crud religion in this world and and I get sucked into it that, that's what I'm saying during the week I have to make sure that Lord free me of of morality being a, a, a morality judge and condemning and because that's not it it's about loving the Lord with all my heart mind soul strength and I want to serve him and we have to find an outlet to do that with our spiritual gifts. And, and, and so that, that is our Lord. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. And He said, I, I have come to give my life as a ransom. I'm, I'm paying the price. A ransom. Being... When criminals take people hostage, they're saying, give me money for this life. We're all being held hostage in this world by Satan, the world, sin. And Christ said, I have come to pay that ransom freely. Not only that, he says, I, no one takes my life. I give it of my own accord. On my terms, my schedule, willing is the Father's will. So that, that, that's to prepare our minds for where we're heading now 
as Jesus is meeting with his disciples on Thursday morning and talking to them, getting prepared for this time of Passover in the nation of Israel that all points to him, where the Passover lamb on Friday would be sacrificed for the people, countless sacrifices, but he would be the one final sacrifice to end all sacrifices. And the only one that would satisfy God. Only one. There is no sacrifice I can do to God that would be acceptable to him except for Christ being that sacrifice. Now, now that Christ is in our life, our lives, with our body, with our mouth, everything now can be a sacrifice given to God. Amazing. And I'm saying this also in in this love that God has expressed to us, we don't deserve. We don't deserve it. And I have to be reminded, just this week even, there are people around us that don't deserve to be loved. (laughs) They do not deserve to be loved, from my point of view. But when I have God's point of view, They don't deserve it. But we love them. We show them respect. Our enemies. This still stuck with me since we started Luke. Our enemies were to speak well of them, pray for them, love them, do for them. It's insane. That's what God has called us to do. I I don't know why this has been put on my heart. I don't know what you're dealing with, but something hopefully spoke to you this morning because this is what's been percolating in my life. Dealing with people constantly that are resistive, that despise the Word of God, that yet they consider themselves Christian. Him. <laughs> I mean, that's, I, there's nothing else to say, but I, I know him. I, Jesus said, my sheep, I am the shepherd. My sheep know me. They know my voice. I give them eternal life. No one can pluck them out of my Father's hand. I, I, I have confidence. That's the word said. This word. I have confidence. God said it. It's not a... It's not a notion. It's not a wishful thinking. It's not power of positive thinking. It's the truth. And my faith is placed in that. So our King Jesus. I had time to talk with Noah yesterday. He's at home heading the grandpas. And um, I got to discuss a little with him about the preparation of the Passover meal and and I'm like Christ is supreme I mean he's humbled he suffers yet he's exalted through it all in his life and he is God and and just with this turn with me to Luke 22 this I, I can't I wanted to cover more verses hopefully we'll be able to cover it this morning Luke 22, it's just amazing. In verse 7, Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. 
Where do you want us to prepare for it? They asked. He replied, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters. And say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks, Where's the guest room? Where I may eat the Passover with my disciples. He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them. That's the remarkable part right there. It, it reminds me of Luke 19 when they're heading into Jerusalem, into the triumphal entry, and he tells them, go into the city, there will be a foal, a foal of, a, of a donkey, never been ridden, just, it's tied up, just grab it. When they ask you, what are you doing? Saying, I'm taking it for the Lord. They did it. It happened just as he said. I mean, was it prearranged before the foundation of the world? Was it supernaturally happened? Did it supernaturally happen? Did Jesus talk to this man before? It doesn't matter. It was all prepared by God. It happened. So we're seeing this here now where he's telling them, go prepare the Passover. Wait, wait a minute. Jesus, who's holding all things together, remember this, Jesus is holding all things together in the universe as the second person of the Trinity. And he's in humanity now. He's telling them to go prepare the Passover. They're like, wait a minute, you're, you've known everything here. What, where, where are we going? <laughs> Don't you have this put together yet? And he's already said, I've got it all set up already. Okay, that, that's just the top thing to see off these verses right away, right? That they're disciples now. We're looking at the disciples. And they've just entered into Jerusalem. They've come to Jerusalem for the Passover. And it's like, okay, where are we going? We're, this is a big deal. And Jesus tells them, I want you to go prepare it. I like where we're going. So this is the time of Passover. It's, it's called the, the Feast Festival of Unleavened Bread. And that's from the Old Testament. It's a week-long uh, celebration of the Passover or the escape from Egypt. And that can be found, uh, the promise of God can be found in Exodus 6, chapter 6, verses 6 through 7. And this is God's promise to the people that they are to celebrate, okay? And, it, and it's God's I wills. Satan had five I wills, remember that? I will, I will, I will, I will put my throne above God. I will be God. God said, no, I will. He establishes his I wills and they will happen. And in this, he says, I am the Lord, the God. I am the Lord. And I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. And I will free you from being slaves to them. And I will redeem you from with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. And I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. And I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and I'll give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. So this is, this is the hope of Israel 
they're to remember, look, we were slaves once under the tyranny of the Egyptians. Slaves. I mean, there was millions of Jews at that time. Uh, slaves under Pharaoh. And God delivered them out. And he saved them at the first point by the Passover lamb, the blood of the lamb being put on the doorpost. God said, I'm going to send the angel of death through the city. It's going to kill every firstborn human as well as animal. I'm coming through, and to save your own child, firstborn, I want you to put the blood over the door jam, door post. And so they would have a meal then every year since that time to celebrate this and to sacrifice an animal as a substitute for their sin. And if, from that Passover meal, that it would save them from death. Okay, that, That's the whole meaning there, that it was a sacrificial lamb. And so they're going into the city to celebrate it with millions of Jews at that time. Possibly two million in Jerusalem at that time. Which is funny to think. I want you to go in the city and look for a man with a jar. Right? <laughs> You're going to see a man with a jar. Okay. There's... All the people are in Jerusalem. They're flooding in there on that day because they're expecting Jesus to come back in like, they, like he has. And they're there for the Passover, to prepare for Passover. So, um, So he tells them Thursday morning, this this happening Thursday morning, there's going to be a little confusion here about the Passover. I'll get to that in a second. But to prepare for the Passover meal, he tells them to go into the city, look for a man. He doesn't tell them a name, location, nothing. Nothing. This is kind of like one of those secret meetings of look for the man with a paper under his arm. Oh. You know, <laughs> that kind of thing. And when you see him, follow him to the phone booth and he'll give you, okay, this is kind of one of those secret, secret things. But he sends John and Peter. They are the leaders. And... He's been giving them special lessons in leadership at this time because he knows he's going to die and they're going to have to continue on spreading the gospel and they're going to be the ones to push. Okay. So the Passover, what happens is between 3 o'clock and 5 o'clock on Passover, they slaughter the lambs. People, families bring in the lamb. The, the representative of the family brings in the lamb. And between the hours of 3 o'clock and 6 o'clock, did I say 3 to 5? Mm -hmm. I mean, 3 to 6, I'm sorry. 3 to 6, they slaughter lamb. Wait, I'm sorry. Because Christ is on the cross for three hours, which is different. But during this certain time, they slaughter all these lambs. Then afterward, you give a portion of the meat to the priest as an offering. Then you take the meat home and, are, and are, as a family are called to eat it all. And usually at a Pass Passover meal, I mean, families can gather together. They said one lamb would feed 10 to 20 people, and they had to eat the whole lamb. So the Passover meal would be after the sacrifices, correct? All right. Jesus is going to eat the Passover meal Thursday night. 
and that, that confused me for a long time. But now I understand. I'll get to that in a second. Um, but he's telling them, I want you to go in, prepare the meal, all, all the fixings, and we'll go into more discussion about that next week, about the actual Passover meal turning into the Lord's table then, um, him commissioning that sacrament for the church. Um, So look for a man carrying water. Now, this isn't, to us, this seems crazy. How is he going to pick out somebody carrying water? But the thing is, culturally back then, women carried water, right? They always carried the water, right? In life all the time. <laughs> the same, carrying the water, right? But um, during that time, women would carry the water. Just like Jesus with the woman, woman at the well, he met her there. She was going to carry the water. So if you see a man carrying a jar of water, he's going to stand out. So that, okay, that makes sense. God has planned this. Some man is going to walk with a jar of water. So the question here we have to ask is, why didn't Jesus say, we're going to John Mark's house? We're all going to meet over at Larry's house. Or, sorry, Jehoshaphat's house. Why aren't we going to this location at this time? Why doesn't he come out and say that? Why is he so secretive about this? Because he knows what Judas is about to do. Or what he has done the night before. Remember? Caiaphas, the high priest, was having a meeting with all the religious leaders. And they were saying, this Jesus has got to die. But in their minds, they're like, okay, we'll kill him. But we need to arrest him. Hide him away. Through all the Passover time. Till everybody's out of here. Otherwise, we're going to cause some type of riot. We gotta shut him up. We'll kill him afterward. That that was their plan. The devil's plan is, as far as I can figure it out, he does not want Jesus to die. He does not want him to go to the cross. And he wants Jesus to be arrested, but to be pushed in front of the crowds for them to push him into the role of being proclaimed the Messiah the king without the cross. That, that's as far as I can figure out in my own shallow mind. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I mean, we talked about that last week. I know you had a question. So I'm still trying to contemplate all that. And then you've got Judas who is ready to betray Jesus because he's so upset that all this has been for nothing. He's all about greed. He's like, I just want, I just want money for the time I've wasted following Jesus which is incomprehensible, but he did not know the Lord. He was a devil from the beginning, Jesus said. He did not know me. And so Judas is going to betray him. And Jesus knows if, if he's with me in the morning and I send these two who I know are going to do what I've asked, because remember, Satan has asked to sift Peter. Jesus tells Peter that Satan wants Peter again. He wants to use him again. And Jesus tells him no. I mean, flat out, he set a boundary for Satan saying, no, you're not going to mess with Peter at all. And he tells Peter, you need to keep praying. And you will deny me three times. He tells him that later. That, that night, but as far as Satan, he's saying, nope, Peter's out of your hands from this time on forward. Which is amazing now. Um, so the devil is working through Judas. The devil is working through the religious leaders. Devil has his will. Judas has his will. The religious leaders all have their wills, all trying to work their plans, which got to be frustrating for Satan. Awesome.
because actually religious leaders are going to push him to go to the cross, which Satan doesn't want to happen. He, they've all overestimated the crowds. They think the crowds are behind Jesus. That's why they're afraid to do anything to him, right? And so Satan's working in the midst of the crowds as well. As, what, as much as he can, they all have free, uh, they all have sinful natures and they're going to call to crucify him. Unexpected, even by Pilate, right? Pilate, who's thinking, this man, he even said in his own words, I can't find anything wrong with this man. He's innocent. So I'll put him in front of the people. They'll surely let him go. Pilate, he's still working the plan of God. They're all working the plan of God, even though they're all working their own wills. And Satan's trying to work his will through them all. And Jesus is saying, okay, I don't want Judas to give me up till it's my time on my schedule. Because tonight I need to sit down with the disciples. I need to, and you can find what he tells them in those last minutes. We're going to get a really brief view here in Luke. But if we go to John 13, chapter 13 through John 16, even 17, you see what the Lord tells them. So that's something you can read this week. John 13 to 16 and 17. This is Christ's last words with them before the cross where he displays to them what it means to be a servant, right? Because even there at the meal, they're discussing who's going to sit at his right hand in the kingdom. And, and Jesus gets up, just walks over, starts washing their feet, and, and humiliates them all. He's going to teach them that, then he's going to teach them about, look, the Passover meal was all about being delivered out of bondage, out of slavery, and being redeemed and being set aside for God to be your God and you his people. And he's going to say, from this point forward, the old covenant is now a new covenant. I am, I'm doing this. It, it, it's being all fulfilled now and I'm establishing the Lord's Supper from that point on. That my life is going to provide for you deliverance from the bondage of Satan, from the bondage, slavery of sin, out of a type of Egypt into salvation, deliverance, to be mine, my own possession. I will be your God, and you'll be my people. I will bring, I will reconcile, reconcile God to you. And he's, he's going to establish that that night. And so he has Judas captive that whole day because Judas wants to go tell them where Jesus is at, right? I, I never, I, I, I didn't know these details so specifically. But Judas is rare that morning, okay, where are we going to be? I'm, I'm, I got to go tell them where he's, where he can be found and I can betray him. Let's get this over with. Well, Jesus sends John and Peter out in the morning. They're gone all day preparing the meal because it's not just, here it is. It's not just drive up window. It, it's a preparation. Even though this guy here, this no name, Jesus knows him somehow. He knows him from the creation of the world. And this man has it all prepared in the upper room, right? Or not the, in, in, the, in, the, in the room, the guest room for him. And Jesus knows all this. He knows Judas wants to betray him. So he's keeping Judas with them all day long. 
And then at the appointed time in the meal, he looks at Judas. And we'll see this detail in the Passover meal when they take the bitter mash, which speaks of judgment and and sin. He, he, at that point, he tells Judas, go do what you're going to do. I release you on my schedule. Amazing. If you were one of the disciples, you hear this, what? Go do what you're going to do. And even Judas. What? I, I would think, right? And he just slides out. And that's, that's in the late hours. Because they've, they're doing the meal after dark on Thursday. And then Judas leaves and then gives them up at the Mount of Olives that night. So that is the reason for all this secrecy here. That Jesus is like, I'm going to keep Judas captive with me all day long and then release him at my time. So secrecy is the issue. And so say to the owner of the house, the teacher says to you, where's my guest room? Where, where is my room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Um, this man knows. He, he, he more than likely is a believer. I can't, we have to pull whatever we can from that. It just says he has no name. He knows Jesus as the teacher. There's thousands of teachers in Israel, but he knows who they're talking about. And he has it all ready and prepared. Now, I'm still working through this. But here's the question. Passover meal is eaten after the Passover sacrifice, right? Why are they eating the Passover meal on Thursday night and Friday is when they're doing the sacrifices? Do you, you understand that? I'm still trying to comprehend it, but... Um, so you've got Thursday and Friday... To the Jews, a 24-hour period begins at sundown and goes to sundown the next day. Did you know that? No? That, that's the way their schedule works. Um, for us, it's midnight, right? Midnight. To midnight is 24 hour day for us. For them, like today at 6 o'clock, or at sundown, I'm sorry, at sundown begins Monday. Okay? That's kind of important. It starts for things to make sense. Um, so their day, <laughs> Friday would start at sundown on Thursday. <laughs> confusing. It's confusing. That's what I'm saying. I'm still trying to work this through in my head. Wait a minute. How can I? illustrate this right. So sundown on Thursday would be the beginning of Friday. And then Saturday, which is the Sabbath, just so you know, Saturday is Sabbath, not Sunday. This is the Sabbath. And this is going to be important too because 
Remember, they have to get Christ off the cross before the Sabbath. That's why the Roman soldiers would break the legs of those on the cross to kill them quickly because when you're hanging on the cross, you die of asphyxiation. Um, that you're trying to hold yourself up the whole time so you can breathe because if you can't, then you can't breathe. It's terrible. It's terrible. But if they found somebody alive after a certain point of the day, they would break their legs to kill them off. Well, Christ, not a bone of his body would be broken is the Old Testament prophecy. As he's hanging on the cross, he willingly gave up his spirit. There again, Jesus is in full control. I, I, it is finished. He breathed his last. He gave up his spirit. And he died before that point of time where they had to break his legs. Okay? And in that time, so that would be sundown. Because the Sabbath starts on Friday night. Does that make sense? So during Friday, so from Thursday night is is the Passover. <clears throat> And between I can't remember, three, three to five, why am I having this block? That's weird. I'm just, I'm just going to say from I'll have to look it up and let you know next week. But during this time is when they when they sacrifice all the thousands, 10,000 lambs at, at that time. Okay. Then you would take it home and eat it on the Passover. Does that make sense? So the Passover meal would happen here. But they're having the Passover meal with Jesus here. After sundown, it is still the Passover, correct? But what about the meat? You're eating the meat of a sacrifice. That happens on Friday. Well, the thing is, culturally back then, during this time of Jesus, the people in the north, northern Israel, they considered their days sunrise to sunrise. To make it even more confusing. Okay? So, for them, their Passover was on Thursday... I don't want to confuse, I'm still working through this, really. I'm, I'm still trying to work through all this. But they would, they would do this sacrifice on this day. And it actually worked out in Jerusalem because there were so many people that they could do all the northern tribes. They're like, these people are crazy. They're those goofy northern Galileans. We'll let them, we'll do the sacrifices, get them half of the people out of here and then do the rest of them the next day. I mean, it makes sense. I mean, it's all part of God's timing. His details with every single part of this. And so they... This still doesn't make sense to me. I'm still working through it. But they did sacrifices this day as well. So when they have the Passover meat, they are eating meat from a sacrifice. Okay. That makes sense. This, this, this part here hasn't sunk in yet. Sunrise to sunrise. My mind does not compute yet. It's kind of rusty. 
sometimes you got to jiggle things <laughs> to get my brain to work. But, but I, I see this, though that they had, this, they had the Passover meal, and the northern tribes, or not, they're not tribes at this time, the northern Israel um, sacrificed during the day, and they're having that Passover. That was a question I've had for a long time, and, and, and I found that out, and it's like, that makes sense. But he's going to become that Passover lamb as he goes to the cross that next day, or actually... They're going to have the Passover meal at dark. Then over that night, he's going to be arrested, go through trials, illegal trials at night. No one's to be tried at night, but they ramrod it through. And then he would be crucified on Friday from... Let me think. So he was hung on the cross from 9 o'clock. And at noon, from noon to 3 o'clock, the sky went dark. That's right, right? I'm trying to keep this all in my head correctly. So he was hung on the cross from 9 o'clock where he, he was up there. You have the whole thieves on the cross next to him. All that transpiring, people mocking him. And, and then at, midnight, or at noon, high noon, the sky goes black. And you got three hours with him hanging on the cross, taking on the sins of the world. And during that time, he's screaming, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's not just the once thing there. It's repeated over and over. So this, this point here, he's taking hell for each one of us on the cross. What I deserve for every sinful thing, disobedient thing I've done, and who I am as a being in Adam, as a sinful creature, He's paying for it. Paying, 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 paying. And at the end, I'm sorry. Oh, no, that, that's right. Yeah. So from 12 to 3, it's blackness. Sky is black. And then at 3 o'clock, he cries out for his last time. It is finished. Okay? It is finished. And he willingly gives up his spirit. That is the exact time the sacrifices begin at the temple. So I'm trying to picture this whole thing. You've got Jerusalem, the city, the temple, people coming in, going to bring their lambs to be sacrificed. Out here in Golgotha, outside the city limits, Christ is on the cross, dying, suffering. And at noon, the sky has gone black. So people are probably confused, right? They're trying to go to take the lambs to be sacrificed. And then 3 o'clock hits when it's time to start sacrificing the animals and the ultimate sacrifice on the cross is happening and says it's finished at that moment. An earthquake. An earthquake hits the city. And people come out of the graves. People during that time, rose from the dead out of the graves. Came out of their tombs. And all of this is happening. So I'm, I had never thought about what's going on at the temple at this time. 
if they, they had three hours of darkness, all of a sudden this earthquake hits, and then the huge veil in the Holy of Holies at the temple is ripped from top, from top to bottom. That means it only can come, it had to have been from God to tear it down. Because this thing was two feet thick, this curtain. And huge. So I'm just trying to put all these pieces together as what everybody's doing in Christ on the cross for those three hours of darkness, and then he just cries out, it is finished. It's finished. And then he willingly gives up his spirit. <laughs> Earthquake and everything. It's just... So the timing, the timing... And so that, it all comes down to the timing. God scheduled events. He had to die at exactly 3 o'clock to be that perfect sacrifice that would end all sacrifices. I mean, I looked into that. They, they, they kept sacrificing after that. I mean, years after, they, they kept sacrificing there. I, I thought after that... They, what are we doing? The Christ died. But they rejected Christ. So they continued with the sacrifice. But it was God's exclamation point of saying, it is finished. And Jesus at the Passover meal is saying, look, the Passover is old news. It's the Lord's table. All this was for me, about me, now, do this in the future in remembrance of me. That I, my body was broken for you. My blood was given for you, the forgiveness of sins and marked a new covenant. A new testament. So that, that was the transition point we're at here with the Passover meal. That was, that was so important that Jesus had to keep it secret even to his disciples because he knew one of them was the devil and would betray him. But I, I just want you to see God's timing on that. Amazing. And I still want to figure this out. I, I haven't locked that in, but I know the northern Israel celebrated it. That was like, okay, that makes sense. Everything makes sense. You just got to study it out. Um, but it was one of those questions you kind of set aside. I'll deal with it later. Now it's time to deal with it, and it all makes sense. And then now, as we look at the actual Passover meal that they have, um, I'm going into the details of, they call it the Seder Supper, or the Paschal meal, the Passover meal, of how blatant it is about Christ, exactly about his death, where there's four cups of wine celebrated as you tell the story, of the escape from Egypt um, about Christ's death. And in the very last cup, they don't drink. Because he said, I won't be drinking this with you until I see you again, right? It's amazing. Um, What a, God, what a great God that, he, that we have that he has gone to every single little detail, even a man carrying a water jar, <laughs> unknown. It's just amazing. And why? For each one of us. What is God? What are we that, we, that God is mindful of us as man? Amazing. Amazing love. Amazing grace. It's all grace. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for who you are, that you are faithful, unchanging. I can put full credit in your word, trust it, and know who I am in you. Know who I am in this world. Know who other people are. Know who are yours and fellowship with them. 
But for those outside that do not know you, Father, I'm praying for salvation. I'm praying for your movement in the lives of people we have prayed for for years and continue to pray for. That we do not give up hope. That they may not deserve to be saved. None of us are. Father, you said to ask in your name. And you'll do it. So Father, I pray for those that we have an opportunity to proclaim your word and your Son, Jesus, to them, that you may open their hearts to the truth. I pray that each one of them would know you, repent, and, and cry to you, and run to you. Father, you've said that you would do more than we can ask or imagine. Sometimes it's hard for me to imagine some people coming to you. But you can do it. You've really been stressing this with me lately, and I know you're going to move in people's lives. Father, in this nation, we need this dramatically, desperately for your movement. I'm praying for the salvation of people in America, that they're turn back to you for believers to turn to you during these times. I'm, I'm asking for unbelievers to have the veil lifted from their eyes and come to Christ. I'm praying for revival in this land. I'm praying for the President and Congress, everyone in authority, police, that they all turn their eyes toward you. That you reveal selfishness in the hearts of leaders so that everyone can see it. And that righteousness may be established in this land. And, and I pray that your word will have great weight in America. I pray for the salvation of people. God, use us. May we be, be your servants. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.